you know, from Kashmir, I'd, I'd like to get your views now on uh, an issue that is very much live, which is Manipur, sir. Yes. Manipur is another issue that has uh, stayed in the headlines in a very tragic manner since last yes. year. Uh, uh, you know, we continue to yes. see what's happening there as well. Your perspective on, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, on the military's involvement in Manipur, this entire situation which came actually from a court, you know, a court ruling had triggered this entire uh, situation. And it is the military that, you know, serves in Manipur and does most of the security work there. Your, your, your uh, view on uh, uh, how see, it is in so far as uh, legality of the Armed Forces Special Powers yes, Act is concerned, we had Justice J.S. Verma led uh, five benches uh, uh, of the Supreme Court, their decision, and yes. they sort of, uh, without hesitation, unanimously upheld the legality. Yes. But then there were certain caveats that were issued by the five judges mm. bench. Mm. For example, they had said that a declaration about uh, an area being a disturbed area and invocation of AFPA can't be sort of uncertain and unlimited. Right. It should have a shelf life of six months. After six months, a fresh notification is needed whether to retain in the entire that geographical uh, uh, entity or to cut it down, remove some districts or whatever. Right. That is not happening. They had also given hmm. the army authority to interrogate and authority to uh, take uh, those uh, weapons, etc., that have been uh, captured. Yes. Uh, now, despite that, the military, I'm sorry to say, has not sort of uh, amended its battle procedures, mm. SOPs, to introduce these things. So there is a need that the act should be humanized. Right. Insofar as uh, Manipur is concerned, it appeared during the Manorma Devi, that famous Correct. case, yes. that uh, the agitation was more against Assam rifles than against the military. Right. And at a certain stage, the state government said, OK, uh, withdraw AFSPA. Now, that was a very good testing occasion. Yeah. It gave an opportunity to the union government and also the MOD yeah. to say that, OK, try it out. If uh, you can function properly, then it is good. But as soon as the situation there, the fight between those ethnic groups in Manipur had started, hmm. perhaps an opportunity had come to take prompt remedial measures. I don't think that have been done because had the army been used there, hmm to in aid of civil authorities, that is the civil uh, administration, perhaps uh, this uh, climate there would not have aggravated to a situation that it did. Right. And therefore, to restore the confidence of the people, I think it was uh, a time that uh, the men in uniform, Olive Green, should have been sent it, there. What would you prescribe the military needs to do right away, sir, that they haven't done? in Manipur as far as these issues are concerned? Uh, Manipur, you see, somehow... Because it's been going on for more than a year now. Yes, quite right. Uh, you see, uh, military in that disturbed area where they have been injected, they need to be given an authority to restore hmm. peace and tranquility and to show their authority that, look, no nonsense would be tolerated. Any illegal, unlawful activity will not be accepted. Right. Perhaps that is not happening. There is, is still uh, interference by the political elements. Right. I'd like to uh, 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 sort of zoom out now from Manipur, uh, General, uh, if, with your permission, and talk about uh, a subject that you're considered actually a global expert on. You've written books on it, on international humanitarian law. Uh, I want to, your perspective on where India is at as far as international humanitarian law is concerned. Uh, you know, India is one of the largest contributors to UN peacekeeping missions across the world as well. Uh, how, is, how is that going, sir? You know, enlighten us on where India stands and what needs to be done. Now, there's something very dear to my heart. Yes. Uh, yes, on the uh, one side, you have brought it out that India is the largest contributor of the UN peacekeeping uh, troops. Uh, India was one of the first countries to have ratified Geneva Conventions. Yeah. And thirdly, India, way back in 1960, uh, 
uh, brought Geneva con Conventions into the domestic law by enacting Geneva Conventions Act. However, after that, disregarding the situation that having won our independence through peaceful means, mm. right from 47 India has been engaged, has been brought into armed conflicts yeah. with Pakistan, yeah. uh, with China, uh, peacekeeping troops, it had to send the troops into Goa, before that Hyderabad, IPKF. So Indian military has been engaged yes. uh, with weapons. Now I find it very difficult to understand given this situation and the fact that it is said that the biggest uh, uh, or an occasion when the biggest, largest number of troops mm. were taken as prisoners, more than 90,000, I find it difficult to uh, comprehend as to how there is no literature still in public domain mm. as to how were these prisoners treated. Right. Very I, true. It couldn't have been that none of the 90,000 uh, did not try to escape. <laughs> uh, there were no cases of manhandling. There is nothing. The historical division of the Ministry of Defense, they also have no, no data on mm. this. That's one. Therefore, the Army War College, the Infantry School, the Staff College, NDC, they do not have any case studies how to handle prisoners. Yeah. What to do, what not to do. There is no reason why after the Geneva Conventions of 49, the two additional protocols that came in 70 decades, the India chose to keep away from them. Hmm. Hmm. There is total silence. There's no debate. There's no parliamentary question. There's no white paper. Uh, there is nothing uh, as regards the reason why India decided to keep away. Uh, there is no reason why India did not say that, for example, anti-personnel landmine treaty, that we cannot accept this for these reasons or say till next 20 years when we would have total surveillance by satellite, till then we need these landmines. There was no such decision given. It is total silence or it's all dark. Yeah. Uh, moving on, India took a very active part in the PREPCOM meetings when International Criminal Court provisions were being drafted. And suddenly, it decided to stay back. I had an occasion to share a meeting with Mr. Ram Jaitmalani, mm. who had been India's Minister for Law and Justice, and he admitted that uh, he was a cabinet minister and he did not know. In fact, he went to the extent of saying that uh, the issue whether India should join or not join yeah. never came before the cabinet. Wow. Now, this is something. Now, look at it. When we had the case of Saurabh Kalia, hmm. who was ill-treated, yeah. or Hemraj, if India had been a ma member or had been a signatory to the ICC, it could have dragged Pakistan there for those inhuman acts, hmm. war crimes. Uh, same situation could have been in the case of uh, Wing Commander, Abhinandan. Yes. We could not invoke those provisions in the case of uh, Kulbhushan Jadav, hmm. where Kapil Sibbal finally had to go in Agu. Now, therefore, by having some underlying fear, India thought that perhaps if we join the additional protocols, hmm. Pakistan may drag Kashmir issue. And this was an unfounded fear. We did not. ICC, we did not the torture convention, anti-personnel landmines, and therefore, apart from these policy, policy decisions at the political level, I have found during my uh, service of almost three decades in the military law, yes. that with the due seriousness, uh, the subject of international humanitarian law, or law of armed conflict, is not being taught hmm. in the armed forces. It is nobody's baby. The infantry doesn't do it, infantry school doesn't do it, military lawyers, they are busy with the, their other work. And therefore, uh, when we compare India with the regard to the other jurisdictions and the efforts that they have made to bring in the pamphlets, uh, the uh, sort of uh, other presses, yeah. handouts, yeah. 
there is an absence with regard to IHL. There is no academy. The language of Geneva Conventions is uh, primarily the Western situation. They still use the word chaplain. Yes. Whereas yes. we have religious teacher. So after 70 years also, there has been no perceptible uh, seriousness or a concrete effort taken for dissemination and India could have taken lead. We are going into G20 and yeah. we are into... No, th th that's what I wanted to ask you. Yes. General, that's what I wanted to ask yes. you. Within India's rising geopolitical stature and responsibilities, uh, you know, is it too late to do those things or, you know, should that be accorded priority now? It should be accorded at most. We, we are a member of the Quad with yeah. the Americans and Australian exactly. and Japanese. So there is no reason why India does not set up a regional school in international humanitarian law education. And I think uh, with uh, experts, domain experts like you, Shiv, yes. and uh, your channel, this, these sort of efforts uh, should be demanded, should be focused. I'm, I'm very glad you brought up in, uh, international humanitarian law, General, because uh, you know we at India Today take India's global reputation very, very seriously, and we track all things good and bad, and therefore this is something uh, I promise you we will continue to highlight.